Welcome to today's session, Ticketed at School. Closed captioning of the program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. As an additional note, this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Today's program is in partnership with the Chicago Tribune and Peoria Public Radio. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at our reporting where we found that many Illinois public schools have been working with police to ticket students for misbehavior at school, resulting in municipal fines as high as $750. We'll hear from students and parents who have been affected by tickets and fines, as well as officials and advocates who will explain the implications for young people and their families. And we're also gonna be answering your questions. So if you have a question of mine, please ask it. But first, we're gonna give you some background. Um, we're gonna tell you how we got started on this investigation and what surprised us. So when we got started, uh, we were looking at police in schools. As you know, um, schools throughout the country have SROs, school resource officers, and we wanted to see what happens when police get involved in student incidents, student misbehavior at school. And so we decided to look into it. When we did, we filed public records requests to school districts across the state. And we started getting records back that showed that tickets or citations were frequently issued by school police officers when uh, to students at schools. That was the very beginning. All right, so once we got an, um, an idea that there were tickets being issued in schools, we began focusing on high schools. And we asked school districts for records of arrests and ticketing at their schools. We quickly learned that many schools didn't know how many tickets had been written on campus. And so we made more public records requests of police departments that had jurisdiction in each district. And we ended up making about 500 public records requests to get this information. We then followed the story into local administrative hearings where hearing officers or judges rule on the tickets that students received at school. We met dozens of families um, who often were very upset that children were being made to interact with courts or court-like hearings as a result of minor school misbehavior. They often were confused by the process and felt helpless, like there was no clear way to argue against a ticket and win. And the tickets were expensive, for some families hundreds of dollars, and for many it was more than a week's paycheck. So we're getting all these records back, we're learning about the hearings, and we decide that we really want to be able to tell the most complete story about what the landscape is in Illinois with student ticketing. So we built this database. We entered all the information from the records we were getting and what we were learning from the records and from the reporting. And in the end, we documented about 12,000 tickets over a three-year period. We identified more than 140 high schools in at least 40 to 45, sorry, counties across the state where students were getting ticketed. And we were mostly looking at high schools, but sometimes we would get records back or we would meet, we would meet families in, in the different hearings. And we were finding that children as young as eight were being issued tickets. We found that police were ticketing thousands of students a year for in-school behavior that you know, was in for many people watching and, you know, maybe it was something that would have been handled by the principal's office, you know, littering at school or being too noisy, breaking something, um, and frequently now for having vape pens. Um, we also found that there were racial disparities in who was getting the tickets. One of the things that helped frame what we were finding is that Illinois actually already had a law in the books uh, that prohibits schools from finding students as discipline. And what was happening here was that the schools were not directly finding the students, but they were working with police who then wrote the tickets uh, that came often with monetary fines. And there was another law that bars schools from referring truant students to police, but we found that that was happening in many places in violation of the law. So ticketing at school as a practice, we found, has had real implications for kids. Some have been sent to collections for unpaid school-related ticket debt, and some parents had their tax returns garnished. So those kinds of consequences um, varied from community to community based on what the local law was and what the consequences were for breaking those laws. 
So we published the story, the first story, we've had a series of stories as part of the Price Kids Pay, but the first story published in April, uh, late April, and we published it. You never know what's gonna happen. Um, is anyone gonna read it? Is anything gonna happen? Um, and we published it, we got a lot of feedback. And then that night I was um, actually at the grocery store. It was about eight o'clock and a friend texts me, a friend who works in education. And she's like, whoa, did you check your email? the state superintendent of education just sent an email to all schools and all stakeholders in education in the state of Illinois. And that email, if you sum it up, basically said to educators, stop this practice now. Um, she said that if your school or your district's engaging in this, I implore you to stop and consider the cost and the consequences of these fines. And she said that school officials had abdicated their responsibility for discipline to law enforcement. And that was the beginning of a series of things that have happened since this investigation first published. Right, soon, soon after uh, our stories started running, the Illinois Comptroller said that they would stop collecting debt um, from truancy tickets on behalf of municipalities. That was something they had been doing um, without realizing it. Um, and then the Illinois Attorney General opened a civil rights investigation related to police ticketing in one of the state's largest school districts. Um, we've had legislators say that they plan to take some sort of action, and many schools have on their own decided to make some changes, including just ending the practice of ticketing at school. Um, we're very much still monitoring this issue, still actively writing about it, which brings us here to today's conversation. Um, I would like to invite the family members who have experienced school-based ticketing to join us on screen now. We really thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have families you know, from throughout Illinois, from McHenry, Sauk Village, Naperville. And I think we'll start tonight um, with Ms. Marla Baker. So Ms. Baker, thank you so much for joining us today. I wanna to tell, tell everybody just quickly how you um, came to experience school ticketing. So you, you encountered school-based ticketing through your daughter, Amara, who was written a ticket accusing her of theft um, of a pair of AirPods, right, at Naperville North High School. And you and Amara have been fighting this ticket for almost three years now, is that right? Yes, hello, how are you? Great, so good to see you. Thank you for, for being part of this conversation. Um, tell us, I, I'm, I'm remembering something that you told Jody and I, um, you know, soon after the story was published. Tell us about getting the news alert that we had, that the Tribune and ProPublica had actually investigated this issue that you had become so familiar with um, and felt like you were kind of fighting it on your own. Tell us about getting that news alert and, and what it felt like. When I first received the news alert, um, I was, the word that I use is that I was, I was very surprised that there had been over, I think in that, at that time, there were like 3,800 um, students that you found that had been affected by uh, the school ticketing process. And, um, I was just completely, completely shocked. Um, I really thought that I was just one person in this incident. Um, I thought that I was very, very alone uh, because I had often tried to reach out to um, higher officials to help get their support in trying to get the ticket dismissed. And so when I saw that there was an investigation that was currently ongoing, I felt like someone finally understood you all as reporters, uh, my voice, my voice and what I was advocating for for my daughter. And that was for her to be free for something uh, that was clearly something that took place in school and should have stayed there. Right, and, and you actually reached out to us, which is how we, we connected. Um, and, and you wanted to tell a little bit of your story. Can you? kind of tell everybody here who's watching and listening how this whole process, this three year long process now has affected your family. It has been very draining. 
this process has been extremely draining. Um, we've been to court over 20 times now, and uh, that process has been scary. Introducing your child into a court of law, uh, it has been at times uh, caused health issues to where um, my child um, experienced panic attacks in the courtroom because children do not know and they don't understand what this is about. They, they, when they, when they aren't in the justice system, when they haven't been exposed to the justice system, this municipal ordinance violation introduces children to a justice system that they just do not know and they do not understand. And it has been scary at, at times it has affected uh, my daughter's health. And for me, it has been a process that has even worn me down at times. I mean, three years is a very long time to be fighting a ticket. Um, and I know it's been a really in intense experience for both of you. Can you tell us a little bit about all the things that you have done to try to get this ticket dismissed? Absolutely. Um, I started with first just advocating to the principal. And uh, when I was not able to succeed in advocating to the principal, I then went to the school board where I received don't, no help. I then petitioned the mayor of Naperville where I received no help to ask him um, if he could possibly look into this situation and um, advocate on my daughter's behalf. But he explained to me that it was not in his hands. He had no power. And then I uh, petitioned to the city council of Naperville. After petitioning to the city of council, I then petitioned to my local state legislators. After petitioning to them, I then um, uh, began to speak with attorneys to see if they could possibly help us with that situation. And we were unable to have attorneys that were willing to assist us. I then reached out to the NAACP uh, DuPage chapter to get them to try and assist us. and. Um, I then advocated as, as high as I possibly could to our congressmen officials as well. So I advocated on every level that I knew of possible for my daughter and yet and still three years later, we're still in court um, from this, this ticketing in school. And, and you, you know, we've, we've written a story just about your situation. Um, so we're pretty familiar with it. You, you're telling all of these people that you're coming into contact with the same thing, which is, this was a misunderstanding. My daughter thought these AirPods were hers, picked them up by mistake. This is not theft and this shouldn't have been ticketed, right? I mean, that, that has been your message to them is that no, no uh, violation of any ordinance actually occurred. It was just a mistake. Is that right? Am I characterizing that right? Yes. Yeah. And, and as you're going through and, and trying to get someone to help you, um, you mentioned that you did hire lawyers. Can you talk about what that has cost you and Amara? Um, yes, we have spent um, over $3,000 in trying to um, obtain an attorney to help her fight this case. Um, often attorneys look at the cost of their services um, versus um, the punishment. And a lot of attorneys told me that this was not worth fighting and that uh, in order for them to fight the case on our behalf, we would have to pay $10,000. Yeah, it's, it's really expensive, really expensive. Um, I, I want to give you one last um, one last word here, and then we're going to move on and hear from some other families as well. Um, what is the message that you think um, the police and schools send to children when they're giving tickets for things that are happening at school, for minor misbehavior that's happening at school? What's the message they receive? I feel that the message that they send children who receive tickets in school is that 
school is a place where you are supposed to receive an education and you are supposed to learn. And when you ticket a child in school for minor misbehaviors, where those are teachable moments, where those are moments where they could grow, where those are moments where they could learn about uh, the criminal justice system, uh, you know, as an entity when they get, you know, older as an adult, they miss those moments to teach those kids. They miss those moments to talk to those children, help them navigate their feelings and emotions, and truly get an understanding of what's happening in that moment when that behavior is taking place. And I also think what they do is they abuse their power and they take advantage of the trust that the children have with them because children trust their parents. I mean, they trust their parents and the school acting, the schools and school resource officers act in place of the parents, according to um, local parentes. And so, which is a, a court term uh, that they use as far as schools being able to stand in place of a parent. A parent would not stand, send their child to a, a court of law over a minor misbehavior. A parent's going to talk to them, sit down, try to understand what's going on. So if you're acting in the place of a parent and you're the teacher, you're the principal, you're the school resource officer, you miss a valuable opportunity to teach that child and help them understand what these kind of behaviors can lead to. When you throw them in the court of law, when you throw them in a, a criminal court, there are so many other issues that can then begin to happen. If they miss court, there can be violations. If they miss court, there can be additional fines. There's so many other things that can happen if they miss that court date. Um, in some cases, there can be a warrant that's sent out for your arrest, depending on the situation. So I, I really do believe that their um, school officials uh, create a divide in the trust with the child uh, they create a mistrust with the parent who is trusting them to act in their place at that time. And I also think that school resource officers end up abusing their power in that situation as well. Thank you, Ms. Baker, so much for joining us today and telling your family story and sharing all of this um, with us tonight. We are um, going to move on to the next family now and we're joined tonight by Mrs. Nipris. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we met, uh, it was probably back in November, December in McHenry at the McHenry police station when your son was there to fight a, uh, I think he was a sophomore, he was there to fight a ticket for a school bus fight in which he said he was defending himself. And your family ended up going to hearings many times, maybe four times, to try to fight this ticket. Um, eventually, you um, decided to pay the ticket. Um, your family decided to pay it. And I'd love for you to talk about your experience with the ticket and, and the hearing process. And really, I guess if we begin, just your first thoughts when your son got a ticket at school and what you thought and what you did. Well, our first thought was, you know, when we, when he got the ticket and I found out that he was like, essentially he got himself out of a chokehold and he just, he did throw a punch right after that. Um, you know, it was, he was defending himself though, essentially. Um, when I found out he got a ticket for that, I'm like, we're, we're going to fight this. Like, there's no reason to pay a ticket when, you know, you, you know, for defending yourself. So why? Uh, I uh, then, you know, and I, and two, I had no idea what the cost would be involved with this. I talked to a friend of mine who is an assistant principal at a school, a town away from us. And she's like, oh, she's like, uh, maybe it's like $75 or something. Well, when we went to, um, it wasn't even court. It's our, uh, it's, a, it's our municipal center. And um, I, I was told there that if we were just going to pay the ticket, it would be four hundred dollars plus fifty dollar court costs, which are I, uh, I guess it's not court, but whatever the fees are for the, you know, for that place. So, um, we were just like, we're not gonna, or we're gonna fight this because he was just defending himself, so we're not paying these fines for this. And uh, 
um, it took, I mean, when we said we were going to fight it, well, then they're like, okay, well, then we have to continue the case. So we couldn't even say anything at that time and like say anything else at that time to defend him, like to, you know, for his case or anything. So um, he just, I, we had to come back and it turns out, you know, we had a snowstorm in there and we showed up at court and they were walking out. They're like, nobody showed up. And, uh, you know, we're just, uh, it, it was just like, we got there a little bit later because he was going to be one of the later cases. And they just decided to cancel, you know, the rest of the day. And um, so we were there, like I said, it was like three or four different times. And like, cause they kept continuing it on us. And finally it just got to the point to where it's like, I just, we want this done. My son wanted it done. I wanted it done. We were pulling him out of school, you know, a couple of times for this. I'm leaving work early. My husband's leaving work early. And it was just, it's, it's, was just a nightmare. Those hearings uh, at the municipal center, as you as you mentioned, are at 1.30 in the afternoon. So as you said, you had to pull your son out of school. You had mm -hmm. to miss work. What struck you about those hearings at the municipal center, about who was there and what the environment was like? Well, there were lots of other high school kids there. And, and to top it up, it's 1.30 in the afternoon. All these kids are supposed to be in school and they all get pulled out of school for this. And, you know, in all of their fines, like for, um, I can't remember what it was, disorderly conduct, I think, were $400 fines. And so, and we had, there was a parent in there who she also wanted, you know, she's just like, when, the, when they said that, are you okay with paying the $400 fine? She's like, no, she goes, this isn't teaching our kids anything. You know, this is, um, they need like community service or something. She goes, can you give my son community service? And so sure, they gave him community service, but she still had to pay the fine. So it's like this, I these fines, like if someone is deserving of, you know, the like some sort of a punishment, paying fines isn't going to do it. It's like they need the community service. And, you know, it's just, and just seeing the amount of kids that are, that were in the courtroom all the times we were there, it's just, it's ridiculous. I remember there was a, a parent at one of the hearings who was adding up all the money each time a student mm -hmm. went up. Um, what, since we have families who are watching this um, and, and educators and, and other state officials, what do you think families should know about students getting ticketed at school? And what do you think should happen? Like happen in terms of um, policy wise? Well, I, I don't feel like the fines are, it's not helping anybody except, you know, padding somebody's pockets or something, but um, just, like, uh, well, just the example of, you know, these kids all getting these tickets and stuff. There are, there's been plenty of times that like my kids have witnessed fights in school, actually not my kids, but like some of their friends and stuff, they've witnessed fights at school and people, these kids are afraid to step in and try to help out, you know, their friend, like to break up a fight because if they get caught in the fight, they get a ticket too. And so people are afraid to defend their friends. So it, just, oh, it's it just, makes everyone, yeah. It's a lot for a teenager to, to take in, mm -hmm. um, you know, high school students. Uh, well, thank right. you also for really, for sharing your story, for sharing your son's story, your family's story tonight and, and letting us know what that hearing experience um, was like in McHenry. So thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And we're going to move next to the Posley family, um, Mr. and Mrs. Posley and their sons. There's Mr. Posley, um, their sons, Jeremiah and Josiah. Um, I think they're, they're here as well. Um, thank you all for being here today, uh, being here tonight. So Jeremiah and Josiah, you both got tickets after a fight in a school bathroom. Um, you ended up getting disciplined by the school and then also ended up with tickets. You, you later got the tickets um, where you ended up having to go to a police station for a hearing. 
And we know you have a lot of concerns about the ticket and the hearing process. And you've all said that the tickets were completely unnecessary. Um, and your school district actually has stopped since the story ran about what happened with you, that your school actually has stopped issuing, working with police to issue tickets. Um, Josiah, let's start with you if that's okay. Uh, we recently talked um, and you told me that you really wish that after that um, incident in the bathroom, that you wish that the school had talked with you and the other students, if, if you, they had just brought you together to discuss what happened that day. Um, what, how do you think the whole situation could have been handled better? I felt like that we probably shouldn't have went to court to begin with because I didn't feel like the situation needed to go that far. If we all would have just sat down and had a talk uh, with all parties involved and after the talk, get each side of everybody's story, see how it started, what happened, what led up to it, and eventually solving that problem so it wouldn't continue to happen and where we all ended off just shaking hands and just being done with it, knowing that we won't have to deal with that again, that would have been a better option to go with, in my perspective. So, yeah. And you had never, um, you know, your family have had an experience, the police, the justice, you know, justice system or this quasi-judicial system in, in the past. Um, Mrs. Posley, Mr. Posley, you've described your concerns about the ticket and, and the hearing process and how this, this situation was handled. Can you share those concerns with, with us? Um, and to, it's a two-part question, but the, the concerns you had about all that, as well as your concerns about how the tickets might affect your children going forward? Yes. Um, first of all, good evening to all and thank you for having us. Um, there was a great big concern on the behalf of me and Mr. Posley. First of all, it was very shocking and surprising to me, as my son stated, um, the incident that took place um, before it went to the municipal courts, you would think it would have been broken down and allowed the children to decipher this with the adults inside of the school. Um, one of the biggest concerns that I have right now, even with the, the children being ticketing right now at this point, for my son, Josiah and Jeremiah, they are, you know, they're students with great grades. Um, they're ABC students. Um, they're on the band team. Well, Josiah's on the band team. Jeremiah's looking to join other sports. My concern is that being ticketed inside the school, how will this um, impact them moving forward. Josiah, um, he, he is basically um, looking to go to college for engineering. Will that ticket impact him, stop him from going to college or going to the college that he select of his choice? So those are some of the concerns that we have as parents. Um, uh, other concerns that we had moving forward um, with Josiah and Jeremiah, being inside the school and um, basically just um, after the fact, they stated that they moved the laws of ticketing children. Our children still have tickets. Are they gonna wipe their record clean? So these are some of the questions that I have concerning my children. But will they be able to move forward without the strife? Uh, Josiah and Jeremiah both have big plans, but a lot of the um, African-American people in the community inside these school systems are not understanding that these tickets are stopping us from moving forward, as well as when you get ticket, how some don't respond to the ticket as they should because they don't have the right resources. If I was a parent that didn't understand or didn't know how, I would have missed that point of advocating for my child as well. We also need to know in the school systems that we do have services for the children and that the children do have rights in the school. For instance, I did not know about Jackie Ross and the community. I was, um, I knew a friend that told me about Jackie Ross. The school doesn't 
um, have these things in a handbook or the rule book that allows you or show you that if your child get in trouble, these are some of the options that can take place or can happen. And some parents who allow the ticketing to go on and left the, the uh, facility, left the schools, left the area where they lived in because they didn't know how to handle the ticket. They didn't know how to fight the ticket. So they just moved on. You mentioned Jackie Ross, we're fortunate she is going to be uh, on our panel later tonight. She's uh, a lawyer and she'll be able to talk about her, her work and, and um, representing students who have gotten ticketed. Mr. Posley, is there anything you want to add um, about what happened when you went, maybe about what happened when you went to fight the ticket or um, anything that really you know, left an impression on you? Well. <clears throat> yeah, once again, you know, I, I feel like uh, basically um, what my son was was basically saying is that, you know, you give them tickets, but are these kids really learning? Are they really understanding what, what, what happened? It ain't so much now about the ticket, but we had a fight at school. Are you all coming back for, for us later? The school did not sit the kids down, did not talk about the situation, did not have these kids shake hands. Hey, we walking away, we squashing this. And you know what? Um, I also want to reiterate uh, one of the other families say, Ms. Baker, they missed a huge opportunity of these kids can learn something. These kids can grow from this. Now we are teaching them something other than just giving them tickets. Why are the kids getting tickets? And like another family say, what are they doing? Putting this money in their pocket? You know, um, cause I, I, I just don't see where, you know, giving tickets uh, made a huge difference. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's, that was supposed to have been against the law to give the kids tickets. So uh, it's, it's, it's something going on that is not being said behind closed doors, so. Jody, I just want to step in a little bit too. It was something that um, striked me while we were in court as well was that the hearing officer that was speaking with us, one of the concerns that I had with Jeremiah, uh, my son is diagnosed with autism. And during the time that we were talking with the hearing officer, he was not um, receiving to the child. He was not understanding his disability. Um, my concern is, is the higher up officials, are they aware of how to deal with children with disability? Um, Jeremiah did not understand exactly the point that he was trying to come across or the question that the hearing officer was trying to ask him. So um, Jeremiah kind of stunned a little bit and immediately he responded afterwards that he should know better. And he told him his, he had one of the highest fines that was out there that night was $75. So my concern is when we're dealing with the court, uh, the hearing officers and the schools, how, how are they intertwining and um, educating each other? Um, I mean, I understand everyone has a job to do, but even I, when I'm out there, I have to know how to deal with people with disabilities, people learning disabilities, uh, physical, mental disabilities. So in this case, my son, I felt like he was treated poorly because he didn't understand exactly what the hearing officer was saying. So it's kind of like, okay, whatever, you knew better, $75, let's move forward. So that was a concern too. Is the higher up officials aware of how they're talking to the children? There was no shaking of hands. There was no apology. There was in, nothing. Jeff was just slapped in the face with a fine and told them to go on about their business. And if they were to return, the fine would either get higher or either there would be more uh, repercussions behind that. It could be a higher fine or either some type of time being served. So, you know, with that being said also, uh, they said that the schools now officially are not giving tickets anymore. So with that being said, they need to wipe these kids' records completely clean and show us in writing that this has been, you know, totally taken away off their records so it won't follow them through the rest of their life. And they need to pay the parents back their monies 
that they pay for these tickets. Moving forward, that's that's how I feel. I remember you telling us that you went back, you thought about not paying it and appealing it, which is a whole process we can get into later. Um, but ultimately you decided you really didn't want this to follow them. You didn't want to be sent to collections and you went back to pay and it was a cash only uh, payment, right? And you had to go get money and then go back and, right. and pay the ticket. Right. And it's um, almost like you're being forced to pay. You know, you don't have too many options, you know, so. We actually heard that over and over again during the year of, of reporting on this. When we, we would meet families, they said, well, I would, they didn't feel like they had any choice. It was pay the ticket now or you're going to go into to debt on this ticket. Um, is Jeremiah still still there? I thought I would uh, yes. ask him a question if that's okay. Yes. Hello. Hi, Jeremiah. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us how how you felt when you were at the hearing, when you went to that you know police station to go in front of the the hearing officer and discuss the ticket. How that how that made you feel that day? Well, um, I kind of felt nervous because you know I don't know what to really say about myself about what happened with the fight usually um you know um okay. I know I'm just um, usually um fight start started um with um Josiah getting jumped and you know I would just um you know, figuring out like where Josiah at and you know, like where Josiah going and you know, I got jumped too. And usually I thought we were just trying to figure out, you know, who started this gang affiliation first, but you know, you know, I thought it would, you know, I thought the court would be over, but you know, um well it was hard. It was like you didn't know what to what you were supposed to say or do in that situation, right? It was like you didn't you didn't know what was what you were supposed to to tell him to tell the hearing officer. It was like a, a tough situation to be in. Yes. Um, yes. Well, thank you so much, Jeremiah, Josiah, um, Mr. and Mrs. Posley. Thank you for for sharing this with us tonight, for all four of you being here. We, um, we really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been, it's been excellent to hear from, from families. Um, I'd like to move us into the next portion of our, of our evening and have our panelists join us on screen. Um, and to you too, we thank you so much for being here today. Um, as they're coming on, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, who's joining us this evening. Uh, first, we have Dr. Tony Sanders, who serves as the superintendent of Illinois' largest, sorry, second largest school district, the school district U46, which is located in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. Uh, school district U46 serves nearly 36,000 students from early childhood through 12th grade across 57 different schools and programs. It's a big district. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanders, for being here. Uh, we also have David Eterno. Um, Mr. Eterno began hearing and deciding cases for the city of Chicago in 1996. And since then, his experience as an administrative law judge and hearing officer under the Illinois Administrative Adjudication Act has grown to include currently serving in that capacity for 20 different governmental entities. We also have Jeffrey Aronowski, who is executive director of the Safe and Healthy Climate Center at the Illinois State Board of Education. The center uh, seeks to provide whole child supports by focusing on the physical, social, emotional, safety, and nutritional needs of children. And Jeff has worked at ISBE for 18 years. And lastly, Jackie Ross is a former special education teacher turned education attorney. She teaches education law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law and supervises a free legal clinic for students from pre-K through 12th grade who are facing issues in school such as discipline, 
special education, bullying, and enrollment. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, let's actually just start right now with Jackie. Um, Jackie, through the Loyola University Child Ball Clinic, you've actually represented some kids, um, as the Posley's mentioned, who have been ticketed and been able to see the process firsthand. You have actually said that these practices are counterproductive. And can, can you tell us what you mean by that? Like, in what ways do you see these practices as counterproductive? Yeah, um, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to speak about that. So um, I would say that I think that school administrators tell themselves that you know, enlisting law enforcement and using this process can scare the kids straight and to um, really set the tone of we mean it, get it together, start behaving. Um, but what it, it does instead is it pushes the student further and further away. They see like, this system creating financial stress for their family, creating a ton of emotional stress for their family. And these teachers, administrators that might have been people that they used to trust now are the total opposite. Um, and they feel much like the state superintendent pointed out in her letter, it just makes them feel more unwelcomed in school and probably much more likely to, to misbehave in the future. You, you've mentioned before that there were, you know, sort of anecdotes that we included in, in some of the reporting that you found really troubling. Um, would you kind of mention what you found troubling, um, you know, kind of down in the, in the investigation itself? Yeah, I would say the lawyer in me was most bothered by the story of the family who was living in the motel and they were getting tickets for truancy. Um, let's set aside the fact that that has been illegal for a couple of years. Um, that family actually was entitled to federal law protections um, because they were living in a motel. They were considered homeless under the law or McKinney Vento eligible. And that means that they should have been getting supportive services from the school to help alleviate that, that burden of not having stable housing. And that can look like a school paying for a family's housing, actually. It can look like a school paying for lift rides to get the child to school on time or tutoring to make up for lost instructional time. So there was a, a huge role that the school should have been playing and they didn't, they were not recognizing it. They weren't playing, they weren't being the support. And in fact, they were going in the opposite direction and you know, throwing this family into the deep end. Um, and of course, they don't say to the, to the you know, police when they're referring to family, they don't divulge the role that they're supposed to play in this and that they haven't been playing that or following the law. And the hearing officers, you know, I, I don't think are well-versed in school law or this federal protection. So they don't know to question, well, what has the school been doing? So the lawyer me really hate, hated that story because, you know, I, I look at schools and their role as kind of developing and creating um, kind and empathetic citizens. And if the schools are not demonstrating fairness and transparency and accountability, if they are not modeling it themselves, then how are we supposed to expect this from our students? Um, and then I think that the other story that really troubled me was the, the young man who had been drinking and he threw up at the bus stop and got a ticket. You know, to me, like that, that could have been such a cry for help. Um, it is developmentally appropriate for children to make mistakes. We know that like their frontal cortexes are not developed. They don't have sound decision-making um, and to respond by ticketing and fining and you know kind of subjecting these kids to like lifelong adult consequences for those childlike mistakes um, is just so upsetting and, and so goes against the mission of public school. We are punishing kids for being kids at a time when it is literally the worst time to be a kid. Um, and I just thought that was that was really, really upsetting. 
I'm going to ask you, since we have you here, um, to just speak to the lawyer and you <laughs> again and tell parents um, what should they do, a parent or a guardian, if their child is ticketed at school? What do you do? Uh, well, if your child has an IEP or a 504 plan, I would say contact Equip for Equality. Um, they are a statewide organization um, that are doing work in this area. Um, and I used to work with them. I should have their number memorized. I will look it up and put it in the chat. Um, if your child does not have a special education plan, they are welcome to call uh, the free legal clinic that I help supervise at Loyola. Um, that number is 773-800-0338. Um, I think, you know, contact, contacting the State Board of Education could be helpful, going to the school board, basically all the things that Ms. Baker mentioned doing, I, I thought were incredible. And let's just like keep putting full court press um, and make sure that um, lawmakers address this, close the loophole and stop this practice. Thank you, Jackie. Um, thanks so much. And we are actually going to move on to an educator now. Um, we are so lucky to have with us tonight, Dr. Tony Sanders. Uh, Dr. Sanders is the superintendent of the second largest school district in the state. Um, and their the schools are across several different municipalities. And we were, we did document ticketing in uh, many of the schools in uh, Dr. Sanders district, which is Elgin U46. Um, Dr. Sanders, what was your first reaction when you learned that students were being ticketed overall um, in your district, ticketed for various reasons? And specifically, we were able to document tickets related to truancy. Um, so if you could share your, your reaction to the tickets in general and the truancy ticket, that would be great. Absolutely. So uh, first of all, thank you for letting me be a part of your panel tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, April 8th was when you reached out to me, Jody, and you gave me a list of tickets that were issued across our school district. Uh, and it was a shock. Um, it was shocked, a shock to me as the superintendent of the state's second largest school district uh, that we had police departments issuing tickets. Every year when we would present our student code of conduct to our board of education, I would reassure our board that our school resource officers were not involved in the discipline of kids. Uh, that they were there as a, a resource for students, they were there to help keep uh, kids safe, but that they were not involved in discipline. And it turns out um, I unknowingly lied to my Board of Education. Uh, so when the report first came out, when you first brought forward 47 tickets that were issued in our across our district for truancy, uh, it was upsetting. And then when I got the follow-up list with all of the tickets that were issued for a variety of offenses, um, I was even more upset uh, and called my team together to, to immediately address the issues. For years, we've had programs for exactly what Jackie was talking about. If a student shows up uh, vaping uh, with a vaping pen or um, having had uh, been drinking uh, before they arrived at school or drinking during the school day, we've had programs to serve those students without needing to ticket them. Uh, so the first thing we do is clarify to make sure that our administrators knew that ticketing is not allowed in U46, especially for truancy. Uh, but that, um, that yeah, it was, just a, it's just, it was a major problem. So it was a shock to me um, that we, we quickly tried to address. I, I would like to note that across our district, we, we do have 11 different communities we serve. Our five comprehensive high schools are located uh, in areas, so they're served by different police departments, including the Elgin Police Department, Streamwood, South Elgin, and Bartlett. And each of our police department reacted a little bit differently to the issue of ticketing. So you would, I think you pointed out in your story, Elgin really never used ticketing as a, as a method of, of adjusting student behavior, whereas other communities did. And so it's something that we've worked with our communities and worked with our local school resource officers also to address. It's an important point because this is such a local issue that one community or one police department in one high school might be issuing tickets and a high school just down the road in a different municipality with a police department that has different jurisdiction is not issuing tickets. And because there's no you know, federal law or guidance about ticketing, there's no 
state law about ticketing at school, it, you really see, um, I think it's, it's called justice by geography. And you really saw that, we really saw that I should say with tickets um, where different towns, different communities handled it differently from tickets being issued to how much the fines were. So that's um, a really good point. You were able to see it even within your own school district because it's across so many different places. Yeah, absolutely. We were, it's, it's very much a microcosm of the state when you look at U46 and the disparity across our high schools and the impact that it had on students. Um, unlike the city of Chicago public schools where it's closely tied to the city police department, um, here it, it is across multiple municipalities. You mentioned some of the changes that you made. Um, can you talk about the student code of conduct and what you ended up doing with the code of conduct after this issue came to your attention? Absolutely. So we've always tried to be on the cutting edge and on the forefront of, uh, of restorative practices and trying to ensure that our student code of conduct is one that encourages the appropriate behaviors, good, good behaviors. Um, certainly, we do take action if a student violates something that either violates the law or uh, board policy. But what we did was we took a look at our student code of conduct and went through every one of the offenses to identify specifically which instances allows the administration to involve our local police department uh, and when they cannot. Um, and it's very much aligned to what the state law says. So if a student brings a weapon to school, obviously that is a reportable offense to the police. Uh, the SRO would be involved for a weapon being brought, uh, but something like vaping or uh, obviously truancy or alcohol use, uh, those do not get reported to the police at all. The police should not be involved. Again, it goes back to the premise that our police should not be in our schools to discipline or meet out any form of discipline for students at all. They really should be there to help build relationships between the police department and our youth uh, and to set good role models for our students. You just brought up the um, issue of a weapon in school as an example. And this came up while we were reporting and we had questions about it after. Um, so I'm hoping you can help answer this question that um, as head of this very large school district, how do you balance the community's desire and the need to have safe, secure schools. How do you balance that with the need to ensure students are not disproportionately disciplined and especially not with punitive measures like ticketing? So I think it's actually the referral process and the need and the desire to reduce referrals at schools when we've been very clear with administrators across our high schools and middle schools. And this is a point for much more discussion. Um, we want to reduce the number of referrals, and we know that referrals um, are disproportionate by race um, and by low income status. Um, and I think in our, in our desire to address the, um, the number of referrals to the office, ticketing became an easy way uh, for administrators to not have a referral then to an office, right? They're, suddenly the paperwork of it, it doesn't exist. The police department handles it. My referrals as the principals go down. Uh, which is perceived as a good thing. Um, really, the referrals should not be the, the metric that we're looking to. It really should be the discipline that results from it, whether uh, that in the district that allows ticketing, uh, whether it's a ticket or suspensions, the outcome should be really what we're measuring instead of the total number of referrals. Um, but ultimately, we need to create environments that are safe and healthy. And so in the wake of the the brutal murdering of uh, murder of, of George George Floyd. Of course, we had a lot of community feedback around SROs and schools. Um, there was a lot of community conversation at our board level uh, and across our municipalities, um, and that was quickly replaced after Uvalde with the call for us to increase the number of school resource officers. So I don't know that we've reached the right balance. Um, I would suggest that in Illinois, the evidence-based funding formula that is in place as long as the General Assembly continues to invest in it, um, we need to be shifting our resources over time to more social workers, more counselors, more psychologists, um, using that evidence-based funding um, and slowly weaning ourselves off of the, the, the need to have SROs in our buildings. Because if we're truly meeting the needs, the mental health needs of every one of our students, then the need to have police in our schools should diminish. And I think that that evidence-based funding formula will eventually get us to that place. As it stands right now, thank you, Dr. Sanders.
as it stands right now, um, there are police in schools and they are issuing tickets. And, and our next panelist, David Eterno, um, is the one of the people who actually hears the cases. So once a child has been ticketed, um, they will appear at a local hearing or perhaps um, sometimes in a circuit court. Um, so David, as a hearing officer, you rule on these cases at more uh, like 20 municipalities in Illinois. Um, and by the time the students are before you, they already have tickets for um, alleging that they violated an ordinance for their community. And your job is to then follow the municipal rules. Um, you know, Jody and I have had the opportunity to see you rule in, in many places um, and see a lot of cases that have come before you. And we've seen you deliver a fair amount of advice and counsel to kids from the bench. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, you, you have a lot of experience doing this. From your perspective, is ticketing and then the subsequent hearing process the best way to handle student misbehavior at school? Well, a few things. First off, Jody and Jennifer, thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this discussion and on the panel. Um, you're right, I, I have had a wealth of experience across a breadth of municipalities. And I do realize that every school, every district has its own unique challenges with uh, its students, funding, et cetera. I understand that it may be easy for a municipality to, or a school to say, all right, everyone gets a ticket. Does that solve a problem though? I don't know. I would rather a different approach. Um, and I'm going to refer back to the, that, that old phrase back in the day. Back in the day when I was in high school, if someone was caught with a pack of cigarettes, which I don't even know if kids smoke cigarettes anymore, uh, but if someone was caught with a pack of cigarettes, they usually would receive a detention, an in-school detention. The more severe the, um, the infraction, it might go all the way up to a suspension, a weak suspension if it was a very bad fight, or something along those lines. And I think a graduated approach would be a more helpful, more, more constructive way. What I, in other words, what I'm saying is, let's say someone is uh, caught, we'll talk about vaping, because that is a very, um, a very big issue in schools these days. Maybe the first time there is a, uh, a referral to an in-school counselor as it relates to uh, vaping, nicotine, things along those lines. Maybe if it happens again, maybe there's an in-school detention, okay? Um, you could graduate up the level, the number, a number of infractions until you decide to finally issue a ticket. Um, let's loosely call it, let's say a three strike rule. The first offense for vaping, second offense for vaping, but then your third offense, okay, we've we tried to counsel you. We've had an in-school suspension uh, or a detention. Accordingly, now we're gonna issue a citation. Um, if in fact uh, that municipality, that school district feels in fact that citations might be helpful, okay, but have a graduated approach. Additionally, some municipality, some school district, excuse me, will have peer juries, which I think can be very helpful depending upon in fact, the type of violation. When someone appears in front of a peer jury, they're also receiving feedback from their own schoolmates, their own peers, which sometimes can carry a little bit more weight than an adult. Um, sometimes that peer might be uh, actually stating things that that student's uh, parents have already said, but it carries a little bit more weight when it's coming from their, uh, their fellow classmates, that peer jury. So those I think are different ways that it could be handled. Uh, I think um, what uh, Superintendent Sanders also stated is, it could also depend upon the type of violation, right? For example, there's a big difference between vaping as well as possessing a weapon in school, all right? Now that level of severity or that seriousness ratchets up a little bit. Um, so as opposed to a one size fits all, I think while it's hard to have gray in the law all of the time, I think we need to make a best effort to do so. And by merely just issuing a ticket, I don't think it's gonna have the desired effect that some schools and or municipalities would hope that it would have. And it could result then 
and some of the experiences that some of the families here have just spoken of. Uh, Ms. Baker, um, with regards to her daughter um, going through almost 20 court sessions, which I, sitting on the other side of the bench, I just, I can't imagine that. I, I'm not doubting her, but that would be scary. That would be scary for anybody. Um, um, Ms. Nepris, and if I'm, if I'm mispronouncing any names, my apologies. Um, you spoke of something with regards to community service as opposed to a fine, if it's gonna go that far to adjudication. I'm a big believer in community service. If a fine is issued, who's gonna be paying that fine? Well, what if the child's not working? What if it's a low income family, then what? Now, once a matter comes in front of me, I have to deal with it under the law. I can't just kick it back to the school and say, shouldn't be here, handle it down below. I can't do that. I've got the case in front of me. I've got a citation in front of me. I've got to adjudicate it. But the more options that are available on the bench and the more you can tailor that to the individual child or the respondent, the better. I make it a point of realizing that I need to meet that student, that person where they are in their life. I can't expect them to meet me where I am in my life or where I want them to be right now, but where are they in their life? Are they a minority? Are they not? Um, have, they been, have there been troubles in school? Are they being picked on? Does it, is that family economically disadvantaged? If it is, if I'm imposing a $400 fine against a, a disadvantaged family, what's that gonna teach the child? Not much. You're, you're raising some really good questions about fairness. You've brought up peer juries and community service and um, you know, the many possible outcomes. Um, you, because you see so many different types of um, consequences across all the municipalities you serve, you know, you're seeing what we referenced as justice by geography, right? In some places, very high fines and no opportunity for community mm -hmm. service. In some places, peer juries and things like that. Is that fair? Number one, is that fair? And two, is it is it your belief that by and large you shouldn't be seeing juveniles before you at all for ordinance violations? Uh, on the first question, is it fair? Um, inherently, no. However, any ruling that I make has got to be based upon the law as it's written. If in fact the municipal ordinance does not give me the authority under their, uh, under their municipal codes to impose a community service, I'm stuck. If in fact it is just a fine, for example, when um, Ms. Nepres was speaking with regards to uh, the, the fighting situation, um, she stated there was a $400 fine now I went online and I, while she was speaking and I looked at their, uh, their or the McHenry uh, ordinances and for that would fall under their disorderly conduct. It's a flat fine, $400. Well, that really doesn't give someone in my position the opportunity to realize that all cases are different and each case must be analyzed on a case by case scenario. Now it's quite possible that Maybe someone did get in a fight. Maybe they were the aggressor, the matters before me, and maybe it was a push as opposed to a five minute brawl, fists of flying, et cetera. And that municipality, let's say, only gives me the ability to impose a fine as opposed to community service. Well, should both of those fighting situations command a $400 fine? There's such a difference. And as every situation is different, sitting where I sit, it's nice to have the discretion to be able to, um, if I'm gonna impose a fine on some sort of a scale, as opposed to a flat, I hate to call it a flat fee, but a flat fee that it, it, it doesn't do justice to the respondents. So that it's, was, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Keep going. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, because you're talking about how it doesn't do justice and then there's so many varying fees, um, I was going to thank you for describing it from your side of the bench, as you said, and I was going to see if um, Mr. Aronowski from the Illinois State Board of Ed Education could talk about it from 
you know, the full statewide perspective. Um, yeah. But thank you so much for, um, you know, Mr. Turner, thank you for joining us and sharing your side of the bench perspective. It's really helpful. Um, and if we move now to Mr. Aronowski from the State Board of Education, the State Board has been focusing more on shifting school culture away from punitive discipline in general. Um, and you do that through offering grants for training and issuing guidance and support to schools. Um, I'm wondering with tickets, when schools involve police in minor misbehavior, and to be clear, that's when the tickets are issued, it's for minor misbehavior. We didn't see tickets issued, or citations issued for weapons. Um, these were for, you know, vaping, possession of cannabis or paraphernalia and disorderly conduct, but not, not weapons, just to make that clear, because it's come up a couple of times. Um, but when schools involve police and minor mis misbehavior, is that appropriate? And is that what you would consider a punitive approach to discipline? Yeah, and, and good evening, and, and thank you for, for having us here. Um, you know, I think, I think sometimes it depends on the actual circumstance, but I will say, and I think we all know, <clears throat> that the key to solving disciplinary issues is not putative measures across the board. It's making sure that kiddos feel welcomed and included, um, and they see themselves and their teachers, and, and there's positive and healthy relationships between students and between staff and students, and quite frankly, healthy relationships between adults in schools as well that, 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 that lend themselves um, to modeling for, for students. And so uh, I think we'd be hard pressed to find an appropriate use of ticketing for, I think what you're describing is, is, is minor, um, minor infractions. Again, I think our limited resources, not at this, just at the state level, but locally, and not just money, but um, time, um, effort, um, communications is, about, is better, better spent on um, creating healthy learning environments and inclusive learning environments rather than punitive measures with a dollar sign associated with them. So we've gotten a lot of questions in uh, the chat and prior to this discussion um, about what the law says. So what, what Illinois law says about ticketing in school? Is it legal? Is it not legal? Um, and how have laws around student discipline changed in recent years? If you can yep. add some clarity to that. Certainly, yeah. Um, so to be clear, um, our, dif our discipline reform legislation um, that I believe passed in 2015, Senate Bill 100, commonly called, um, expressly prohibits um, the issue, issuing of a monetary fine uh, as a disciplinary consequence uh, by school districts to students. Um, that is a zero tolerance policy against school districts and charter schools and other public entities or public schools um, to issue monetary fines. What we're seeing, however, and I think what you had uh, uncovered in, in some of your research um, is that it's not schools necessarily in some of these instances that are fining the students. It's the referral to, to a local public agency, a law enforcement agency, for instance, um, and referring that to the municipal, uh, municipal courts for the issuance of a fine uh, by way of a ticket. Uh, so be clear, school districts are not allowed under statute to issue fines as a disciplinary consequence. Would also say, um, school districts are also prohibited from referring truant students to public agencies, um, including a municipal police department, um, if the consequence for that referral would be to issue a fine as well. Um, so that is something that we have seen some school districts um, engage in. In fact, um, I really appreciate uh, you and your team bringing up the state superintendent's um, you know, message to all school districts. Um, some months ago, we did conduct a, a survey over the summer. We're looking at the, uh, the results of that survey now, many districts have told us, um, yes, we have referred um, truant students uh, to municipal police departments, or yes, we have um, um, issued a monetary fine uh, as a disciplinary consequence. Um, and one of the things that we've done um, is send a letter to each of those districts that indicated um, that they might be in violation of law. Ask them for clarity. Number one, are we understanding, right, what you're saying, what you're telling us? Um, asking them to give us an assurance that those practices will immediately stop, but then offering our support. So to pivot off of punitive measures, but what can we do by way of offering what we have in and around social emotional learning, trauma-informed instruction, trauma-informed um, thought processes, by the way, not just for students, uh, but for staff as well who are experiencing trauma themselves, but also through their students' eyes. What can we do to help you get to where you need to be so you're supporting your families and not being punitive? You're talking about the survey and the survey results and, and the reporter, the investigative reporter in me is immediately like, well, tomorrow morning I'm gonna be asking you 
more about that and asking for those results. So I know we'll be following up um, on that. I you mentioned Senate Bill 100 and, and discipline and how the um, it's the you know schools can't issue the fines to students. That was clear in SB 100, but as we've discussed all night, that it's you know the schools are telling the police and then the police are issuing the tickets. So do you think there's a a loophole in this law that's being used and and what do you do about that? Does is be uh, advocating to to change that law to tighten it up? What what do you want to happen? What does the agency want to happen? Yeah, most certainly. I yeah, I don't know if you call it a loophole, but it is a way to get around the basic requirements of what Senate Bill One Hundred um, explicitly prescribes in terms of the school district's obligation um, towards its students and its families. Um, I think what we're seeing is a disconnect between the Illinois School Code, which governs school law and school actions and many variants of the municipal code and probably other provisions of criminal code or civil code, I should say as well, excuse me. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that the General Assembly would take up any changes on the quote unquote other side of the house, the non-education, you know, statutes in the house, uh, that's certainly under their purview. Um, you know, we, what we're looking for is what we can, what we can use in the school code, which we have authority to implement um, to bring, to bring relief and supports to families. Thank you so much. We, we're getting so many good questions that we're going to kind of shift into a Q&A here. Um, and we, we really appreciate everybody's feedback. Um, a lot of questions came in uh, ahead of time, and, and we have those and are going to get to some of those. Um, you've also been asking some really excellent questions live. Um, again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and submit it to us. Um, just one other thing I want to point out right now is that um, we would love for you to fill out the event survey that's in the chat box. Um, there's a link right now dropping into uh, the chat box that will um, allow us to collect some feedback from you about how we can do this better. Um, but let's move on to our first submitted question. And I think this is, this is a good one. We had several submitted questions about whether ticketing at school happens outside of Illinois. You know, Jody and I documented what was going on here in the state, um, but we are very, very lucky that we have somebody who can answer this question for us. Um, Harold Jordan, who is the Nationwide Ed Education Equity Coordinator at the ACLU has actually studied this a bit. And I'd like to invite um, Harold now to, to tell us um, what is happening outside of Illinois and whether ticketing is even a thing elsewhere. Oh, ticketing, uh, thank you very much for having me. This is a really important topic. Uh, I've been working on this issue since 2013, so it's not a new issue. Uh, I've been chasing school districts and police departments for data on this, uh, and we've worked all over the state of Pennsylvania. So as a baseline thing, I would say that every state is different. Every state law is different in terms of whether this is permissible and uh, the consequences. The consequences actually in a place like Pennsylvania are actually much more severe. So in Pennsylvania, a kid who gets a ticket is ordered on the ticket. It looks like a traffic ticket, literally looks like a traffic ticket. Uh, the kid is ordered to appear before a magistrate judge in adult court. It's not in the juvenile system. It's not an administrative judge. It's the lowest level of judge in the regular court system in the adult court system which means that they're not, they don't have a right to a lawyer. They're not represented by public defenders. Uh, if they don't show up, they don't get the notice or their parents don't understand what it means. They can be tried in absentia. Um, and the result is usually a fine. It's sometimes a fine and, and community service, but if you don't pay the fine, then you are automatically referred to the juvenile justice system, which is, uh, has more severe consequences. Uh, because it is in the adult system, it means it is a criminal record, unlike what would happen in the juvenile system. That is the system that we have in Pennsylvania. So, for example, if a kid who has been found guilty, um, whether they pay the fine or not, uh, if they're asked on an employment application, college, et cetera, whether they've ever been convicted of a crime, they would have to say yes. If they were in the juvenile system, a delinquency is not considered a criminal conviction. And so these uh, minor, you know, things that are sort of considered minor punishment by school officials and by law enforcement can have grave consequences depending on the overall uh, laws in that state and the system in that state. That is the Pennsylvania system. 
The other thing that we have found here, and this is also true in other places, is that generally you there's not a lot of transparency with regard to the data that is kept, who keeps the data. Uh, we've been unable to get statewide data from the court system. But what we have found in the pockets of the state that we have, um, where we have been able to get data one way or the other, is this is a highly racialized form of discipline impacting mostly black students. So you take the second largest district in the state of Pennsylvania, one out of 70 black students receives a citation, one out of every 400 white students receives a citation. You take another mid-sized district in uh, Pennsylvania and you find that black students are, it's not even a majority black district, but black students are receive citations at four times the rate of whites. We also find the same patterns with disability, where students with disabilities in the same district receive citations at twice the rate of students without disabilities. And most of those students with disabilities who receive citations are black students. And so there is something bigger going on here. And in a place like Pennsylvania, by definition, these are for minor uh, infractions, such as loitering, loitering, typically harassment, disorderly conduct, and littering. Those are among the more common, and vaping is sometimes thrown in. So, you know, these things can have more, much more serious consequences in terms of the record that is left and how kids are dealt with. But I think it's important to, to note, and, and the, the investigative work that's been done by other journalists actually confirms this, is that this is a heavily racialized form of discipline impacting Black students. And that needs to be said. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a, a key finding of the work we did, and we've seen some, some other journalism around this, um, you know, including in Pennsylvania. So thank you so much for sharing um, what you know, a the little bit <laughs> that you shared with us about the many things that you know um, about ticketing in Pennsylvania. You, you actually mentioned something that lots of people have asked about, which is, does this create a record for kids? Um, ordinance violations are considered quasi-criminal. Um, they're not criminal matters, but maybe Jackie Ross can field this one. Um, it, do any types of records get created that could follow kids um, even beyond high school? Well, yes, and I think some of your reporting talked about this, that it, it is kind of easier than you would hope to find um, students' names, what the fine was, what they were accused of doing online. And then um, Ms. Posley spoke about this, that there's this question of some colleges, um, you know, phrase questions like, have you ever, you know, been cited for anything other than a traffic offense? Um, and I think that there is an argument that if you have been cited for, you know, something like disorderly conduct, um, that you would have to divulge that information on that application and it could impact whether or not you get into that school. Um, and because it is only considered quasi-criminal, you don't have a right to expunge the record um, if you receive it as a minor like you would if it was like a criminal. Um, so it, it's a gray area um, and yeah, it, it, it's really awful. And I, I think that this, you know, several people have tapped into this that suspensions and expulsions um, and the law around that is so highly regulated and there are so many eyes on it um, that that is why this is being used. You know, it is, it is a, a lazy response to discipline. It is a hasty response to discipline um, that schoolmakers can take advantage of. It is a phone call. And so all of these protections that are put into place to protect kids with disabilities, to protect black and brown students, those are all stripped away when it is such a behind the scenes process. And that is the issue. And uh, just, again, I, I would just want to add that um, every state is different with regard to this, and some of the consequences can be more severe, uh, and that's the important thing to understand. Yeah, just just last week, Jody and I actually uh, were able to look in a circuit court um, public record and see students who had been ticketed um, while, while they were quite young. Um, lots of people have asked about fines as well. Um, we we noticed that there were some very large fines um, that were issued 
uh, in some communities. Um, and people really want to know where does the money go? And I'm actually going to toss that to Jody um, so she can tell you a little bit about what we found about where the money goes. The question was often also, does the money go to the schools? And the answer is no, the money does not go to the schools. The money goes to the municipality. So it goes to the city or the village where the tickets are being issued. And the uh, process to run these local hearings, these non-court hearings, the ones the families have talked about today at the village hall or the police station cost money. They, have to, they hire um, someone to oversee the hearings. They, their staff, to, to run them. Um, and it's a, it's a system, it's like a mini court. So the fines that are being paid by the students or other people in the communities that are getting fined is they are going to the municipalities. Um, we were also asked about an appeal process. Can you appeal? Yes, um, if, uh, if you're ticketed and you don't agree with the hearing officers rolling, there is a period of time, about 35 days, I think you can appeal that ruling to the circuit court. We found that sometimes hearing officers like Mr. Eterno explain that to the people um, in front of them. And oftentimes that was not explained. So there is a hearing process. It does cost money to appeal. So again, there's not really an incentive to do so. Sometimes the, the cost to appeal will be you know, cost prohibitive. Um, as it relates to the fine, just like Ms. Baker was, was talking about earlier, or other families, it's like, you know, at some point you're, you know, paying so much to, to fight an ordinance violation ticket. Right, again, over a, a minor matter. Um, one other thing, this is, this is a question I think is good for, for Dr. Sanders to take on. Um, one other thing people have really wanted to know is, is whether we should be treating kids any differently inside school versus outside of school. So let's take the issue of like vaping, right? Or, or possessing cannabis. If you were at the local mall and you had a vape pen as a child, you could be ticketed by police should they see you there. Um, what's the difference in, in school? It's a great question. I think the difference is, is in a school, you're surrounded by people who are there to uh, serve and redirect you. Whereas the mall does not have the staff to provide that level of support. So if it's in the community at a, at a local mall, um, I can see where that might, might be something uh, for lawmakers to look at it as, a, as an exception uh, in the future. But as a school district, our role is to mentor, support, and redirect students. And so I would see our role as one to, uh, to do that instead of issuing a ticket or uh, meeting out some discipline. I hope that was responsive. That that was responsive. Thank you. I was trying to unmute there. Um, we just got a question that I would love Jackie to answer if if you can. Um, it's someone who who wrote, "Kids are being sent to court and not allowed legal representation." This just sounds wrong. What kind of court is this? Uh, okay, so I think. Um, Kaylee, are you asking in the municipal hearings? Um, so they are allowed legal representation. Um, it's not required. And the problem is that so few organizations provide this type of legal assistance and even fewer provide it for free. Yeah, so it's a very different situation than being in juvenile court or being in criminal court. Um, I, you know, I wanna, it's always kind of nice to, to bring up some solutions if people see a problem. Um, so for, at. For Jeff Aronofsky at, at ISB, um, are there tangible steps that school districts could commit to taking um, that would reduce racial disparities and the things that we're seeing that, that are so apparent in student ticketing? Um, are, are there things that, that districts can be doing right now? Absolutely, I would, I would encourage any school district that hasn't already to engage with our student care department, um, studentcare at isbe.net. And we can refer um, school districts and, and their teams um, to some of the programs that we have out across Illinois. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with Lurie's Children's Hospital um, uh, in and around resilience education um, and advanced community healing. So the REACH program uh, that started off uh, with a couple of dozen schools and it went statewide this year. Um, also our social emotional learning hubs um, that are spread out throughout, uh, throughout the state. 
really trying to equip adults to understand where kids are coming from, what happened the night before, what happened the morning before uh, the morning of school, um, you know, kind of equipping folks to look at, um, uh, you know, uh, restorative measures. Um, you know, someone was talking about, um, you know, peer juries and what, what can we do in and around those areas? Um, you know, uh, also, we would encourage you, um, encourage folks to talk to the regional offices of education. Um, over this last year, an additional $12 million was allocated to the regional offices of education throughout the state, specifically to address issues around truancy, um, especially after the pandemic as well. So there are state supports available. There are regional supports available. Um, would love to have some communication if folks want some more information on that. Oh, uh, that, that's a good solution. What what um, what other solutions are there? Does anyone else want to jump in there and and talk about other other solutions? Where do we go from here? So uh, we've been engaged in this issue on the policy front in various school districts, and our recommend we've been asked for a recommendation. And our recommendation number one is to declare a moratorium on the issuance of of citations in schools. Now. In Pennsylvania, which is also true of many other states, one model of policing is for school districts to have their own police departments. So in Pennsylvania, several of the largest police departments are actually part of a school district. So it is a, simply an administrative authority matter for folks at the top of that district to say, this is not a form of, of discipline that we're gonna permit in that school district. In districts that have school resource officers, we tell those districts, well, you can make this a condition for having them there, or you can place this in the contract that you have or any kind of agreement that you have that this is not a practice that is permissible in our school district. So I, I think that in most states that um, school officials can make decisions that could substantially, could result in these citations substantially being cut back. It is not just something that law enforcement does. The larger problem is that school policing is a lightly regulated or largely unregulated activity. Can, and if I could just jump in, um, you know, we've touched on this. The issue is, is the municipal code, uh, or I'm sorry, this, you know, the no discipline, no fines for student discipline is under the school code, right? It does not restrict what the municipalities can do, what the police can do. But I think the easiest legislative lift would be to put into the school code that school districts are not allowed to refer students to municipalities for fines. So similar to what was passed with the truancy law and fines. Now it's not a perfect solution because we know from your reporting that it was still being done and we, we have a responsibility to get the word out. But I think that that seems to be the easiest legislative lift, while at the same time um, trying to develop more restorative practices, um, investing in social workers, many other things that the superintendent was talking about. If I might. I guess, I think. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm being told we're out of time. This has been so amazing. I, we're gonna have to end with it going, uh, the finger being pointed, I guess, to the legislature based on what Jackie said. What are they going to do next? Is there something that they can write into the school code. Um, but I wanna thank the family members who shared their accounts today, our panelists for this very engaging conversation, which I think could go on and on, um, but can't. So, and thank you to our audience for joining us and your very thoughtful questions. Again, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email with the full video of today's event. We'll also post the recording on the ProPublica YouTube channel and from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your evening and we hope to see you next time.